afternoon. Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Stephen Rubini. I'm a disaster risk management specialist at the World Bank, where I've worked for 10 years on issues related to water resilience. I was based in South Asia for four years, where I worked in Bangladesh and Nepal. I then led our global work uh, around resilience planning in cities before moving to Vietnam to work on similar issues in the East Asia Pacific region. On behalf of the World Bank, I would like to welcome each of you to the 2023 Cities on the Frontline Speaker Series number two, Building Water Resilience, How Cities Are Transforming Water Challenges into Opportunities. For any Naftanini, I'd like to start with some ground rules. Let me remind everyone of the intentions of the Speaker Series and the ground rules for the conversation today. The purpose of these global seminars is to have an open and honest learning conversation. The calls are not on the record, and we ask you to not attribute any comments unless you have the person's express permission to do so. We can help you obtain this permission if needed. We have about 300 registered participants for the call today. So to facilitate the discussion, we ask you to write your questions with the help of the WebEx Q&A function. Please note that the recording of the session, as well as the PowerPoint presentations, will be posted online uh, by next week. Nini, over to you. Thank you, Stephen, and hello from Singapore. I'm Nini Purwajati, Senior Manager Programs and Knowledge from Resilient Cities Network, and I have the pleasure to introduce today's very important topic and the speakers. Many cities in India have been experiencing the dual challenges of flooding and water scarcity in a cyclic manner throughout the year. The intensity and frequency of water-related shock and stresses in Indian cities have been alarming in the recent years. Being at the forefront of those shocks has driven cities to find innovative solutions to build resilience to these events, and it is important for us to learn from their experience. I'm also very excited to have this session in time with Resilient Cities Network recently launched Cities Solve Cities Deliver com campaign on water resilience. So first, we will hear from Islin Kaur, Senior Environmental Specialist with Water and Environment Practical at NIUA, the National Institute of Urban Affairs, um, India's leading national think tank. We are grateful for them for co-organizing today's session as well. Islin has more than eight years of work experience in urban policy design and implementation, city master planning, regional planning, and capacity building. At NIUS, he has been working on integrated urban water management with a focus on both urban groundwater management and urban river management. Islin will guide us with water resilience in the Indian urban context. Her colleague, Sarat Babu, the lead technology data solution and innovation at Climate Center for Cities, NIUA, will also join us during the Q&A. We will then follow by learning uh, from the cities. Dr. Somnath Petacharya, environmental geologist and senior consultant with more than 20 years of experience in the areas of environmental safeguard, coastal zone management, uh, wetlands, environmental and social impact assessment, as well as afforestation, will share with us about water resilience and best practices from Kolkata. And next, we will welcome Dr. Nisha Mani, project manager with the Nature Conservancy, Chennai, Tamil Nadu, and glad to have Chennai, one of our member cities, represented as well, Dr. Nisha is an environmental specialist with a demonstrated history of working in the environmental services in India through conservation and promoting integration of natural infrastructure for building healthy cities. She has worked in the areas of wetland restoration, water treatment, environmental awareness, climate change adaptation, project planning, and sustainable development. Unfortunately, Dr. Victor Sinde and Anjali from Kerala State will not be able to join us due to urgent matter, but we will still have very strong set of panelists today. So without further ado, Islin, the screen is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nini and Stephen, and good evening, everyone from Delhi, India. 
So I'm Ishleen and like uh, Nini mentioned, I'm a senior environment specialist with the water and environment vertical at NIUA. I'll just go ahead and share my presentation. Uh, Nini, I hope it's visible. Okay, thank you. So just to give you a brief background about the National Institute of Urban Affairs, it's an autonomous body of the Ministry of Housing and Urban Affairs, and we basically assist the central ministry and the cities with a lot of technical topics with knowledge development and capacity building of city officials. Uh, and without further ado, I'll actually go straight away into the story of how NIUA became a part of building urban water resilience narrative in India. So, uh, just to take you a little bit, uh, you know, the backstory of how we came to this point. So, India signed the Paris, uh, Paris Agreement and that's when the realization dawned that cities have to be the major, major focus areas for climate mitigation and adaptation. And that's how in 2019, the Ministry of Housing and Urban Affairs launched Climate Smart Cities Assessment Framework, which was looking at scientifically assessing how much are our cities prepared for the imminent climate uh, crisis. So from there, after the results came in, we realized that we need a driving, you know, a, a force that will actually become some sort of institutional setup that will lead this dialogue and lead the actions on this. And that's how in 2020 Climate Center for Cities was established at the National Institute of Urban Affairs. And with that, the Climate Smart Cities Assessment Framework 2.0 was launched. Parallelly, what was happening was there was also a realization that water resilience is one of the major, major focus areas. And in, in that uh, area, the first initiative, which was a first of its kind, Cities Alliance was established in 2021 with 30 member cities. And now in 2023, we have 100 member cities of River Cities Alliance. I'll probably take you uh, through that in the later slides. But just to give you a brief background of how cities became the major focus area when it came to building resilience uh, against climate change. So when we looked at the CSCAF 2.0's results, we realized that between the first round and the second round, there was progress. Cities were already taking certain actions, certain interventions. But there was also a realization that a lot of these interventions were not holistic. They were very piecemeal. So, uh, you know, if you, if you look at your screens, you'll realize that between CSCF 1.0 to CSCF 2.0, we had nine cities who had reached a certain level uh, in the city ready readiness or city preparedness towards climate change. And again, there were cities that were, you know, pushing themselves and reaching this level. So this whole scientific evaluation method became the evidence for us to start our initiatives and bring, you know, the focus to whatever the pressing challenges were. So within this CSCF 2.0, there were 126 cities that were assessed. There were 28 indicators and 96 data points. And among the five themes, one was water management. Water management had these, like you, on your screen, you can see these six indicators that were being looked at when it came to assessing a city's uh, readiness towards water resilience. And what we realized was that you know, while the cities were moving towards a better position, there were 59 cities among 126 cities that were still looking at assessing their water resources assessment. The capacity, capacity or the understanding of resilience still was building. I'm sorry. Then among the third, like among the 126 cities, 30 cities had conducted some sort of assessment around the water resources. So there was some idea of the existing water conditions or water resource conditions. 16 cities had developed water resources management plan and 21 cities were in the stage, like various stages of implementation of this plan. So this became our base for working out, okay, what, what is, what are the areas where cities need handholding cities need technical support so that's how you know the whole the initiatives that i'll take you through in the later part of the presentation that's how we came to those interventions it was a very very scientific process 
so the key issue so we are all well versed with the issues that are related to climate crisis we all already know that what are these major issues but when it comes to looking at what was actually hindering mainstreaming water resilience in indian cities what was becoming the roadblock we could see very very prevalent patterns so in a developing economy you know you always have this debate around development infrastructure development and ecologically sensitive and sustainable development and there's always a dilemma between consumption and conservation because it's a rapidly urbanizing economy so the investment the basic basic thing is the investment is actually directed towards these focus areas so you know it became really important for us to see okay how we can you know really really uh, counter these problems and then the other very prevalent pattern was that the urban local bodies with this rampant urbanization was always in fire fighting mode and crisis management when it came like when the crisis is right there it is was becoming the model and probably to certain extent still is so the idea of resilience where you look and project what would be the future scenario was not there so that's how that was where we were you know we were starting to hit the nail we were starting to realize okay we need certain mechanisms to move away from these kind of approaches and start building resilience and also looking at the future scenarios so now i'll take you through the initiatives that we you know we kind of uh, developed or the kind of alliances we built so that we can counter some of these problems one of the major major uh, success was having a river cities alliance there was this perpetual uh, you know uh, observation that cities when they are looking at rivers and especially the river cities they are mostly looking at rivers from the consumption lens there's no uh, effort towards conservation or there's no effort towards demand optimization uh, or pressures on those rivers were not being realized so this this river cities alliance was formed and we are very proud to say that right now within the you know two years that we have been working on this we have 100 plus alliance member cities and um, you know this the, the focus areas were to actually encourage peer learning if one city saw the other city working towards you know certain interventions there was this encouragement and this belief that okay we can also do it so there it was basically to you know encourage that kind of peer learning then also providing them technical and hand holding support there were problems that came to us which probably we also had not thought of so it became a very very you know it became a co-learning and co-sharing exercise for all of us and also to create certain guidelines some certain technical documents and tools for urban river management so that was the whole intention behind the river cities alliance and the first initiative that happened and again this is a first of its kind urban river management plan where we looked at these this template this 10 point agenda which this the first six objectives that you see are actually looking at uh, the ecological restoration or management of rivers so when we were working with river cities we realized that the narrative is mostly around pollution abatement but there was so much more to urban river management and that's how this 10 point agenda came into light and you know uh, we kind of developed uh, this agenda to not only look at the ecological resilience of these river cities, but also to look at the socioeconomic aspects of these rivers. Once the cities start seeing the, you know, the amount of dependence that cities had besides the ecological resilience point of view, there was a new, you know, a new thinking around the whole urban river management. So if you look at the later objectives, they are mostly looking at the economic potential of the river which is also, you know, take with, with consideration to the carrying capacity of the river and also to engage the citizens for a long term uh, sustainable effort at river management. So, so yeah, so this is one of the examples, which is also, you know, it has been inspiring for NIUA and the team to look at. So this is one city in um, Western India in Maharashtra. Uh, and it's a it, it's a city that lies in the semi arid region. Uh, it's called Aurangabad. And what we saw was it has a seasonal river flowing through it. So this what you see on your screen right now is actually a seasonal river. 
and what the city started doing was they started uh, managing the solid waste they started stone pitching and dredging but that's that's you know why i'm showing you uh, showing this to you is that was the piecemeal intervention that we were trying to counter so after you know certain tex technical expertise came their way this is the city, this is that river now. So they developed the whole riparian stretch with the native species. They started restoring the groundwater, natural springs and wells that were in the flood plains to enhance the base flow. And it also became a space for the community. So, you know, this is a river that was actually associated as Nala, as a drain, as an open drain in the city. And now people of the city are proudly saying, oh, this is our river, this is Kham Nadi. So it was a very, very good example wherein the city led the whole thing and, you know, they got technical partners, technical expertise from the local uh, uh, organizations there. And this is what they could reach to. So, so, you know, this example, now that we show to River City Alliance members, it becomes an inspiration for them that, okay, we'll also, we can also do this. So coming down to the other parallel things or uh, other parallel areas, uh, focus areas that were there. So there was also, uh, we developed guidelines for river sensitive master plans. So we had an experience that in, you know, draft Delhi master plan, we realized that if you give some sort of legal sanctity or legal backing to a lot of these initiatives, it becomes easier for cities to implement. And Delhi master plan became the first master plan that started looking at the river zone. They started looking at, you know, river as a different land use, floodplain as a different land use. So it became really easy for the city to regulate development in those zones. Uh, then also, you know, urban water bodies, realizing that the whole system, the ecosystem can't be ignoring the water bodies that are there. And with our interactions with cities, we realized that a lot of the cities have not documented or mapped the their water bodies let alone the conditions of those water bodies and we were losing water bodies because of development and encroachment so that's where the urban water bodies diagnostic tool came in it's a simple open to all online tool that the cities have now started to use to map their uh, water bodies and it's a rapid assessment tool so you don't have to have scientific you know knowledge it's it's really anyone can use it so those were the two things that we, you know, started looking at to bring in the whole ecosystem approach and start mainstreaming this whole idea into cities planning. Then also came the point about groundwater. So India is one of the, you know, largest groundwater dependent country. And we, reali we realized that while again, from the consumption lens, the focus was coming on deep aquifers, but deep aquifers, you can't recharge that easily. It takes years to recharge. So the focus, you know, came down to shallow aquifer management, which is backed by the largest water mission of the world, AMRO 2.0 of the Ministry of Housing and Urban Affairs. And with the, with the recent incidents of flooding, we realized that a lot of this water can be captured and taken back to the ground, wherever there are potential recharge areas, potential shallow aquifers, we can take that water back and start restoring our aquifers. So it was not only looking at water resilience, you know, from the ecological point of view or from the consumption lens, it was also looking at the socioeconomic aspects around it. So there's a traditional legacy of wells of using shallow aquifers, tapping shallow aquifers in India. And that's why you know, in Bangalore, uh, Biome and other organization was able to uh, bring back the well diggers, which were which was a skill that was dying. So they were able to bring back around two lakh wells in and around the city, which was really, really inspiring. And then it was also, you know, it was always the community area. It was always, whether in villages or cities, it was a common area that people used to gather around. Uh, so. We were also looking at the rest restoring the community commons. And lastly, it was about bringing back the traditional wisdom. So a lot of conservation efforts, if you look at these pictures, were looking at the physical restoration of these structures. But then you have to bring the functionality back too. So the rainwater project in Hyderabad, again, our local partners, they started bringing back the functionality. They started started using the rainwater, capturing the rainwater to revive these step wells and eventually revive the shallow aquifers. And the result was, you know, you can see in the last picture, the result was amazing. It was wonderful to see that 
people were realizing the value of these uh, wells in restoring the groundwater. So, so, you know, these have been some examples which have inspired our journey. And the idea is to look at these at scale. So there's alliance that we have. We have, you know, so many members that we are trying to bring this knowledge to. We are, we're trying to show them on ground that, okay, this is quite possible. And that's how we are pushing the water resilience, uh, you know, journey of Indian cities. So I'll end there. Uh, that's my email ID and uh, that's our website. You can actually uh, look at the website. We have other projects also associated with water resilience. So yeah, thank you. Thank you. Nini, over to you. Thank you so much. Isla. It's so inspiring. I'm sure we'll get a lot of questions later on. Uh, now let's hear from Kolkata and Dr. Somnath. Uh, the screen is yours. Thank you, Nini. Uh, um, as already been discussed, that water resilience is not a subject based only on uh, groundwater. And many factors are there, including the the rainfall, the intensity of rainfall, the adjoining rivers, surface water supply to the to the households, uh, then groundwater abstraction, groundwater recharge, so many things. So. But as per the as per the advice of the organizer, I will concentrate only on the groundwater part because that is my, that has been my subject to, for today's discussion. As you know that the groundwater is a very small percentage so far as the entire hydrological cycle is uh, as is related with that is concerned. Only 2.5 percent is the force uh, fresh water of this entire thing of the of our globe and out of which only point or 20 percent uh, is the groundwater even within 20 percent groundwater not everything can be used because a 50 more than 50 percent is soil moisture so we have to be very cautious regarding use of groundwater to have a sustainable development of the city let me bring you to the Kolkata city. Kolkata is a city, metropolitan city, having an area of 206 square kilometer with a population of 6.2 million. And population density is uh, huge. This is 30,000, more than 30,000, which is more than three times of New York City or four times of Singapore City or Tokyo City, five times more than Tokyo City. The filtered water supply, which is basically the water taken from the river Ganges, the Jadig River Ganges, passing through the western side, that is about 437 million gallon per day. But this is the official figure. Official figure also quotes that the wastage in different treatment plants is about 30%, and about 30% of it get the wastage during the distribution. And so only 40% of these reaches the end users. And the number of large tube wells from where the groundwater is being abstracted through in the KMC area is 350. This is official figure. <coughs> Sorry, the official figure, but unofficially it must be more than 1,500 or something like that. If you look into the uh, into the groundwater scenario, aquifer details of the Kolkata city, there are two major clay, aqu clay aquitar, we call it in the geological language aquitar or layers. One is at the top of entire thing, that is oh, with a depth of 10 meter to 60 meter and at a depth of 400 meter below ground level, there is another huge clay layer. And the, all the aquifers of the Calcutta city that is there within sandwiched between these two layers. So thereby it is obvious that the aquifers here are not in a conf, uh, are not in unconfined unconfined state, but this is or are confined or semi-confined area. And what uh, just now Islin was telling regarding the water recharge in the first uh, first layer. 
or not that department layer. In Kolkata city, even the recharging of first layer is difficult. In most of the city, most of the part of the cities, although there are small pockets where water also was found in the unconfined state. Now the, the piezometric level or depth to water level varies from in the pre-monsoon period about 6.55 to 20.48 million uh, meter below ground level. Whereas the, in the post-monsoon, that is again 6.3 to 18.26. This indicates that there is hardly any recharge during the monsoon season within the Kolkata city. In fact, the aquifers in Kolkata city that are getting recharged far away, about 200 kilometers uh, from Kolkata city in the district of Nodia in somewhere around Kodinghata and some other regions. So the, the if you look into the ground or central groundwater uh, data, you'll see that the most of the entire Kolkata city, that is the water level is below 10 to 20 meter, that is the below, uh, that is in the pre-monsoon and in the post-monsoon also, that is the, that is very little area is coming out of this. As a result, if you look into the hydrograph of Kolkata city, this is the, this is the area where Rajabhavan, the central part, and this is in the Jadavpur, which is on the southern part, you see that the hydrograph, it is completely declined over last 21 years which indicates that the water is not, groundwater is not getting recharged at the rate in which it is being abstracted, which is a very serious issue. And so we need to look into this problem also, otherwise in future we can meet a very serious condition. The aquifer, this is, the, this is a uh, schematic diagram where aquifer is in a confined state, at the aquitas and this aquitas, this is near on the eastern part, Salt Lake region. So, what are the little the challenges? Looking at the challenges here, groundwater cannot get recharged directly in Kolkata city during monsoon, as is obvious from lack of fluctuation of, of depth to water level during pre and post monsoon seasons. Second, this is the data of uh, from the Central Groundwater Board, as you know, this is the nodal authority in uh, in India to tell about the groundwater situation. This is uh, maximum, this is pre-monsoon 6.55 and uh, post-monsoon 6.3. So this is the level of, or uh, this is maximum 20.48 in some of the cities, uh, some of the areas, and post-monsoon this is 18.26. So this is very serious issue. Now, the another challenge is the out of 144 municipal wards, not all are covered with the municipal piped water supply, that is the river, river water after filtration from the river Ganges. So in many areas, the groundwater is being abstracted in the multi-story building, housing complexes, and the continuously, the, they are creating some permanent cone of depression. It has been estimated by the geologists, it has been shown that in last 70 years, in some of the areas of Kolkata city, the groundwater level has decreased by about 10, more than 10.5 meters. Now, this is a serious thing because this creates a void land within the aquifer, which can lead to land subsidence at any point of time and destructing the buildings over there. And so this needs, a, although the, we, the geologists, as well as the, if you look into the policy documents, every time we tell that the conjunctive use of surface water and groundwater is, it is the need of the war. We need to do it. We need to, we are, that is the advocacy. But unfortunately, that is not being followed. If you look into the environmental clearance situation, I am also a member, I was a member of Environmental Appraisal Committee of State. So there, the, for any uh, development of any construction of any building more than uh, 20,000 square meter, they need environment clearance. And the environment clearance, because uh, I must say that because of pollution or something like that, the 
the KMC gives, the Kolkata Municipal Corporation gives the undertaking that we will do, we will supply the water. But in even in the housing context where I am living at this moment, the spiked water supply has come after 20 years and we are having a huge colony of more than 1,500. We were fed with the uh, with by the water, ground water, and people, I don't want to blame the people, but they need water for their livelihood, for their life and everything. So, do we need to have some strategic development issue, which should be followed in case of this. Number one, uh, uh, this RRR principle need to be followed strictly on cases of future construction, like, like dual fast toilets. We, this is, we have been advocating that you should please and use this in for future housing complexes where the high that is HIG complexes, which is not too, I mean, too costly. But okay, let us do it for, for saving the water. Second, the STPs, the sewage treatment plant, the housing complexes need to be followed, need to be monitored by the pollution control board on regular on regular basis because at the time of consent to operate of the building at that time there was some uh, some kind of supervision some kind of inspection but after that nobody comes and so the stp which are being advocated at the time of the getting environment clearance that we will do it for use the uh, effluent water for through dual plumbing system into the toilet flushing or for gardening and car washing to reduce fresh water supply. But again, that is not being followed everywhere. So this needs to be monitored on regular basis. The rainwater harvesting, I was just looking that someone was asking the rainwater harvesting whether this is whether this gives any positive result. Yes, it gives. The Kolkata city, we of course, there are, we have considered only that there is about 1200 millimeter annual rainfall, but it is more than that. And as per the as per our calculation, say for example, 1,000 meter square rooftop, we can get 0 0.768 million liters per annum, and even after some wastage. And as per the policy guidelines of the Environment Department, depending on the number of stories of any building, you have to make rainwater harvesting mandatorily if the building is more than having a built-up area of 20,000 square kilometer, square meter or the housing complex is more than 20,000 meter square. But some of the areas is surface storage and some of the areas are if it is more than a huge uh, multi-story, then you have to make the subsurface storage or the directly recharge into the aquifer through deep tube wells. But the, where the EC conditions, say for example, I have seen that in one of the huge complexes, the EC condition is that you have to build up 78 such, uh, such type of deep tube wells and uh, so that the ground, entire area, the groundwater can be recharged in that region. But unfortunately, that has not been followed because I have visited it after two, I mean, on an unofficial visit after two years, and I've seen only three groundwater, uh, groundwater research points are there. So this needs to be done. As uh, my previous Ishleen was telling, the urban wetlands are extremely important. I just want to give this, these water levels, all these wetlands, maybe, maybe very little, maybe not of much size they can extremely useful as a buffer during the heavy rain and also they are the storage ecological what she was telling then ecological balance that can be maintained and the urban wetlands if there if it is required that their banks needs to be strengthened that should be given that should be made only by the biodegradable materials so as to so as to keep the uh, biodiversity alive within that otherwise this will be the pond of that of pond that will not be utilized because uh, there will be no phytoplankton, no zooplankton, it will be lost. And so encroachment of these wetlands by the land sharks need to be stopped. And these uh, urban wetlands need to be properly maintained to environmental for to ensure environmental services. So then one of the major advantage of Kolkata City, this is my last slide, that okay, this is the East Kolkata wetland, which is on the eastern side of our Kolkata city. Now, for the last 100 years, the people's wisdom, they are using 
city sewage <clears throat> into number of wetlands and uh, which is creating livelihood of more than uh, 20,000 families and one lakh, more than one lakh, 18,000 people are dependent on this. So this area, this is a, and this has been a wetland of international importance. But again, this area, this, I don't know why, why the Ramsar Convention has not put it into the Montex record that is showing the red flag. But this is also under threat. Even after the high court injunction over the no development area has been designated by the 1992 judgment. So this is a classical example. I am not advocating definitely to on the raw sewage to feed into this wetland for growing the fishes. We call it a western resource field, war field. But in other cities back here, where there is treatment plants, Kolkata does not have any treatment plant, where already through Ganga action, some treatment plants have been constructed. There the effluent from the treatment plant can be utilized in the back in the back here, cities back here or in the fringe wetlands to produce resources and get some kind of uh, making some kind of livelihood and resources for the local people. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sona, for your presentation. And I guess this will be in line with the next presentation. Uh, Dr. Nisha, the screen is yours. Thank you, Nini. I'm sharing my screen now. Can you see my screen? Yes, and we cannot see you yet, so it will be good to show yourself. Thank you. Okay. Just a minute. Do I have to go back and we can see your screen, we cannot see you. Yeah. Yep. Yes, great. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Nisha. I'm from the Nature Conservancy India. So Nature Conservancy is an environmental conservation organization. We work on science-based approaches towards conservation of land, forests, and oceans. And uh, our company, our organization is around 60 years old, and we work across 70 countries across the globe. And when we, and I work for the cities program with the Nature Conservancy. And when we started a program in Chennai, that was in 2017, Chennai was then facing a drought. And it was preceded by a deluge then in 2015. So we wanted to come up with a nature-based approach that could build climate resilience for the city. And that's how we started our work in Chennai. And we are also alliance partners with NIUA. I'm glad to share, out, share that. And uh, we are also very thankful for the resilient city who always uh, keep, make us a part of the knowledge sharing forum with, uh, with you guys. So I really appreciate that. And coming to our project, uh, this is an on-ground project where, uh, uh, I mean, our other work included policy, influencing policy, etc. And this is a work on ground. Uh, this is about restoring an urban wetland, which will help in building climate resilience, uh, contributing to climate resilience, which when which way, which is when replicated across the city will get will give greater benefits. Uh, for this project, we we worked with uh, partner organizations such as Carrot Trust, Indian Institute of Technology, and Finnish Consortia, Oasis Designs, and the Madras Terrace. So. Uh, this is the urban wetland. You can see the picture on the left. It is called Sembakam Lake. The aim of the project was to improve the water storage capacity and thereby influencing the groundwater recharge in the area and also to improve the water quality of the lake because the lake was receiving a significant quantity of wastewater from the surrounding areas, representative of an urban lake. This used to receive waste, both solid and liquid waste from the neighboring areas. 
and uh, uh, aim of the project also included improvement of biodiversity habitat because since the lake was polluted uh, it was it was facing eutrophication problem thereby it which influenced the change of uh, the natural habitat of the lake so we also wanted to improve the biodiversity habitat and also create a recreational landscape for the people around Based on our work, we wanted to document it as evidence based concept and create best management practice guidelines so it can be replicated for other urban wetlands for scientific restoration. And uh, the about the Sembakam Lake, uh, the details are it is about 100 acre uh, extent of wetland and the storage capacity is about 10 million cubic feet and it is connected to one of the last natural wetland of the city Chennai, which is called the Palikarne marshland. So whatever efforts that we are taking here for rejuvenation or improvement of biodiversity habitat or improvement of water quality is going to improve, it, it is going to impact the downstream lakes as well. And also finally the Palikarne marshland, which is a Ramsar, uh, which is a Ramsar site. The lake is surrounded by more than 10,000 plus households. So whatever benefits you are bringing here in terms of uh, a flood mitigation or groundwater charge would also help in the neighborhood areas. And this lake, while choosing, had a strong community involvement. The basis of choosing this lake was number one, community involvement and the stakeholder discussions that we had. These are some of the environmental issues that that I just uh, that I just mentioned to you. Uh, the lake receives sewage or wastewater from all around the lake, and uh, because of this sewage or wastewater coming in, there was deposits of sludge, muck and silt problems that had accumulated and compromised the storage capacity of the lake and we estimated i mean we measured that about 8 million liters of wastewater was coming into the lake every day and our approach has been uh, with the help of iit and carrot trust we carried out a thorough study of the lake involving including its hydrology hydrogeology water quality morphology all of that based on which a restoration plan was was crafted and a restoration plan involved desilting of the lake, uh, deciding on an optimum depth based on the hydrological conditions and the geological conditions of the lake. Uh, because we cannot go too deep uh, on a lake when, when it has fractured weather, uh, fractured weather rocks, and so that it will lead to seepage of the water from the lake. So we had to come up with an optimal depth for dredging. So all those studies were conducted based on which desilting depth was decided. And based on the water quality, uh, which was not even fit for biodiversity propagation, uh, we came out with a plan for treating the wastewater and uh, bringing the lake to category D, to meet the category D of Central Pollution Control Board surface water standards to meet wildlife and fisheries propagation standards. And we also were planning for eco-friendly landscaping so that the community around can also enjoy the natural recreational space. This is some of the pictures where we did a water quality survey, geotechnical survey, had focus group discussions with the community and also a biodiversity survey. These are some of the photos of the work that we undertook at the lake. Uh, one is like we dredged the lake. For dredging, we had to pump out water from one area to the other because sometimes the lake was certain portions of the lake were was always filled with water. So we had to pump out some water and dredge the lake. And with whatever silt we took from the lake, we strengthened the embankments. Just like Mr. Dr. Somnath said, we used to nature materials like the silt removed from the earth to strengthen the embankments. And also cleared the embankments of invasive weeds and bushes so that native species can be planted and it can be thriving. And uh, the wastewater that wastewater treatment method that we chose was nature based. We chose constructed wetland system to treat the incoming wastewater. Uh, yeah. So, and the other concept was uh, there was another alternate plan to divert the wastewater so that the lake is not polluted anymore. But that approach will is only going to divert the problem from one place to the other either to the STP where an intensive energy requirement is needed for treating the wastewater or it is just going to pollute any other downstream area. Uh, 
whereas and not only that if you are diverting this whatever sewage that is coming into the lake the lake will be dry in the next three to four continuous dry season months so treating this gray water and letting it into the lake is also going to replenish the lake with water perennially and while we chose the uh, treatment plant for the waste uh, for the wastewater treatment at the lake we considered several options like we uh, compared conventional semi-mechanized treatment, semi-natural treatment and full natural treatment method. And we did a cost comparison, area required comparison, all of that. And we narrowed down on this method called aerated lagoon plus reed bed method. So you can quickly see uh, in comparison of the cost, the installation cost of this nature-based method where we are using reed bed and uh, aerated lagoon was two third of the conventional treatment method. And when you look at the operational cost, it is just one third of the conventional treatment method. And on the contrary, the area required for the nature-based method is three times higher than the conventional treatment method. This is a disadvantage. And not only that, we need very precision engineering for the method to be successful, which involves gradient. So, uh, this is the overall scheme of what we are going to do at the lake. Um, uh, so, uh, uh, you can see at the bottom, there is a sedimentation tank. So, whatever wastewater is coming, we will be diverting it into the sedimentation tank where sedimentable substances will, will, will be removed. Uh, and then it goes to the aerated lagoon where the water will be aerated and the biological oxygen demand of the water will be reduced. So, it is further amenable for treatment by natural methods or phytoremediation methods using plants. So, once the water is aerated, we will be pumping it to the, I'm mean, sorry, it is, it will be going through the gradient method, we are not pumping it, we, it will go through gradient method to the subsequent reed beds that are in order, like in primary reed bed and secondary reed bed. And by the time the wastewater treated wastewater enters the primary reed bed through the secondary reed bed, we will get treated water quality that will be let into the lake and uh, lead to the replenishment of the lake. So this is the plan that we are adopting. This is an ongoing project. Uh, the work is under progress. We face several challenges. Uh, one, because the nature-based solutions have not gained much popularity. Uh, uh, that is one challenge and nature-based solutions, we don't have much proof of concept for these that are happening So to convince everyone, uh, the partners or the donors and the community. It, it's, been a, it's been a challenge, but still we are working towards that and we, we are getting support and we are going ahead with this amidst challenges and I think we'll be able to complete this successfully. Yeah, so overall, uh, this is the project outcomes that we are planning. Uh, the, uh, uh, we have already achieved a water storage increase in water storage capacity of about 1 lakh cubic meter, which is resulting in about uh, an increase of water storage capacity by 50,000 cubic meter a, a year. It is 50,000, sorry, it is mentioned 50 lakh, yeah. And uh, we are also aiming to achieve uh, improvement in water quality of the lake to category D of central pollution control board surface water and also thereby in impacting uh, biodiversity, improved biodiversity habitat and also improved community connectivity to the lake. Yeah, so this is about it. Thank you. And uh, I also, I wanted to mention about the next, pro the other project that we are working on currently, that is again, uh, integrating natural conservation of natural infrastructure and integrating it in cities development project, uh, development process. It is called a uh, green printing project where we use com computer simulation models to identify such blue green infrastructure in the city and how vulnerable they are to the proposed expansion of the cities. So this is the other project that we are working on. I hope I'll be able to update about that in our, one of our next meetings. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Nisha. It's so encouraging to hear uh, from your presentation. I'm really looking forward to actually visit Chennai again and visit the lake again. Uh, and I'm handing over to my co-host Stephen for the first set of Q&A. Shani, and I, I think we've been getting, um, we've been getting some good questions in from the audience. Um, so for those who are connected, please feel free over the next couple of minutes to continue adding to your questions. Um, I think we've, we've seen some, some excellent presentations so far. Um, to me, there's a, a couple things that, that stuck out. 
um, in particular, sort of the, the trade off between gray and green solutions, looking at uh, nature based solutions and, and how, um, you know, how what needs to be done uh, in, a, in a complex urban environment also needs to be uh, fit into uh, what's already there, focus on things like conservation um, and the urban fabric and figuring out how to make things work in the context uh, of, uh, of a rapid, often rapidly urbanizing environment. Um, in that context, I wanted to ask uh, the speakers, um, we, we didn't speak too much about some of the challenges that you face. I know from the World Bank side, when we're looking at these projects, we always have to think about things like resettlement, um, environmental safeguards, uh, and the trade-offs between costs um, and benefits. And um, so what I'd like to ask is, what do you see as some of the main challenges uh, to your project or in your city um, regarding um, some of these, these trade-offs? What have been the hardest battles to, to get done? What needs to get done? Uh, uh, one thing would be the encroachments uh, in the blue green areas. Like there are encroachments uh, in the forest as well as uh, the around the water bodies. So it has been very difficult to handle that part. That's one thing. And the other thing that I said during my presentation, like nature-based solutions, we don't have much proven concepts to prove its adoption and to influence its adoptions for cities, just like how the gray infrastructure is. So those are some big challenges that we're facing now. Yeah. Can I go ahead and answer? Yes, please do. Okay. So, um, so one of the major things that we feel while working with cities, you know, like I also pointed that out in the presentation that there's always uh, this dilemma that where do we direct our funds? You know, funding uh, has been one of the issues which becomes the impediment to a lot of good projects that are out there. So, in, you know, when there's a comparison between uh, having a water supply uh, system or water supply scheme that is bringing water from 60 kilometers downstream to protecting a river that is flowing through your city, the priority always goes to the infrastructural solution rather than, you know, focusing on the city. And that's what, that's the thing that we are trying to change. But it's a slow process. There's also resistance to change. But you know, while we are working on it, we are also finding solutions. We are realizing that the more we bring in local experts and local wisdom, it becomes more powerful. The argument becomes more powerful because they are the citizens also asking these questions. So, so yeah, one of the major challenges for us is, you know, how to build this understanding that there's no fight there. There's no versus there. If you are looking at consumption, you are also you also have to look at optimization of demands. So this this understanding is very very slow right now. So so yeah, that's that's one of the challenges, broader challenges that we face. Go ahead. <clears throat> Actually, uh, while working with uh, with the urban city like Kolkata. One of the major challenge is the is protection of these small small wetlands. Now, the its inventory is very much required. Maybe there is some inventory that is or that is uh, in the of course in an officer's file or some somewhere here. But that map of these, which can be easily accessible by the local citizen. Uh, there are the, these are the wetlands and these are the kind of things and these are the number of because in last 10 years or so huge number of wetlands have already vanished because of this urbanization and one of the major environmental problem of this is the urban heat island many areas the too many construction are coming up and the, the temperature, the ambient temperature, night temperature, if you look into the business district of Kolkata and in the eastern part, the night temperature, there is a difference of more than 4 degrees centigrade because 
I, I was a scientist and I work with this regarding this from the uh, from remote sensing data from the IR data we have done this and this is creating flooding also because after all Kolkata is having Kolkata is such a city that water is being discharged into a tidal river and 12 hours of Kolkata for 12 hours in a day you can't discharge because during the high tide situation you cannot open the log gate and discharge the already collected water in here so these wetlands play a buffer role a storage of water and this needs to be protected and this we should secondly we should also create awareness people are aware but that needs to be given in such a manner and so that some instrument needs to be think of so that we need to think of some instrument but they also get the courage to stand uh, i mean uh, with uh, and challenge the this land search with eye to eye that is one of the major challenge over here yeah thank you dr sona i think we can go with one more round of question i guess uh for me, it's really striking your reflection, I think, from almost all of you on how you reflect on the history, culture, and going back to, to nature. Um, as we are facing more and more extreme events at a very rapid uh, pace, I know you mentioned it's challenging, but can you mention briefly have, what have been successful from your experience uh, so that cities, they're willing and adopting uh this approach maybe uh Islin, you can start followed by uh maybe dr somnath and nisha okay thank you thank you nini very interesting question we are also trying to find answers to that through practical experiences but i think it it's it's actually uh going to be a mix of these hard infrastructure based solutions and you know these softer nature based solutions because in a country in a context like india it's fast urbanization it's rapid urbanization it's urbanization that is not even monitored or accounted for at times and the cities have such different scales and such different capacities that you can't have that expectation that you know there, there, there's going to be one solution that fits for all so so it will always have to be because you know at the end of the day city bodies have to answer the citizens about why there is no water why there is, you know, uh, the quality of water is degraded. So it will, it will always be a mix of both the solutions, the hard infrastructure solutions plus plus the nature based solutions. It's that mix that we are we need to tap on. Okay, what is the right mix for a particular set of cities? Okay, what can really help the cities fast track the implementation and also, you know, kind of build that kind of understanding towards creating resilience. So I think that's something that we all need to strive for. Actually, uh, if you if you tell me the success story, one of the one of the major success during the last uh, say I say twenty years or so or twenty five years, you know, whenever you want to purchase something, say one house in a city, you want to make it cost effective much less much less whatever cheap i don't want to get but now particularly middle class and high middle class they want that the environment should be environment should be clean environment should be good there should be wetland and even artificial wetland if it is not a swimming pool but even the wetlands in and there we will find the hoardings also that okay you can fish from your window because we are trying to create one large wetland for you and that that expenditure there are people are ready to bear and that's that's a, something which is extremely important now in some of the areas the we say some of the i don't want to mention any name of the con huge contracting groups the, the real estate groups but some of the real estate groups they tell yes we are costly because we pay for the environment and so that that awareness among the people 
and among the real estate businessmen that is coming on regular basis but if that is if there is a uh, some political will that okay we need to follow this then it will be more easier and islin can definitely help us in this matter thank you i i absolutely agree with you sir you know uh I think behavior and, you know, this aspirational value to nature is still something that we are building on. And it's right now in a very, very nascent stage. But here's hoping that we'll soon reach there. I want to give you one example. I was a member of ACAC and then one of the promoter, one of the building company, they were presenting and there is some vacant land behind that. Maybe they have kept it for future expansion or something like that. We tell, we advise them that uh, why not putting one woodlock over there, let's say some forest of kind of thing. And so they are telling uh, people don't like, they will think there's a jungle behind the alone. put. You, you make this within, the, you put it within your diagram and make it and then see whether people are alive, people like this and that and put some some of the kind of say some small, small creatures over there, some butterflies and other kind of things. You, you will get the cost, you will definitely get the cost of the land and they did it and it was a success. So we need to advocate also this, is, uh, that is the major challenge. Thank you, Dr. Sonar. I'll, I'll invite Dr. Nisha, for one last short comment before we close. Yeah, uh, I'd like to add like uh, coordination amongst inland departments and integrated planning would go a long way in bringing success for uh, building uh, resilient cities. Yeah, that's it. Thank you, Dr. Nisha. And thank you again. Thank you so much for all the speakers. Uh, it's been a really good session. I know we can go for another hour. But I think, <laughs> unfortunately, we need to close. Um, so I would like to remind everyone that we have two upcoming sessions in March. So the first one is the our Spanish Latin American session uh, on women and resilience, 9 of March. Another session on energy resilience will take place on 30 of March. Uh, please note that going forward, we will move to Zoom webinar platform. And on behalf of Resilient Cities Network and, and the World Bank, we thank you for being here. Good afternoon, good morning, um, good evening, and goodbye. Thank you.